if anybody has questions, please raise your hand. I saw that uh, three or four centers had already raised their hands earlier, uh, but I don't know if they still have that question. So please raise your hand online if there is a question. We are going to Netaji Subhash in Kolkata. Yes, sir. My question is that uh, you, in the last uh, point, you, what you have discussed that uh, you cannot keep the password in a script mm -hmm. file. Okay, yeah. so usually when we go for the student project, we use mm -hmm. the session variable and uh, mm -hmm. which uh, gone through the whole sessions. Say yeah. when we are swapping from one value to other page, mm -hmm. ah, on that time you usually use the session variable. Yeah. So you told me that uh, you just keep in the config file. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sir, is there any problems if you keep it in the session variable? Yeah, the session variable is not an issue because uh, you cannot directly access the session variable except through the application program itself. So there is no security vulnerability in storing it in the session variable. The session variable, uh, by the way, is never passed back to the user. It's completely stored at the application server. Uh, the user's browser only sees some session identifier, but not the actual session variable. So there is no vulnerability there. Does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Vidya Pratishthan, Pune. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, my question is how to prevent the SQL injection at the database level? Okay. Uh, you cannot actually prevent SQL injection completely at the database level, but there are certain things you can do to reduce the vulnerability at the database level. But that actually requires cooperation with the application, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in the next half of the talk. So I will answer your question in that part. Okay. Um, what is it? Knowledge. Knowledge Institute, Salem. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, sir. Is it possible to use a key distribution center in Manet? Uh, in Manet, we won't have any nodes. So all the nodes will be act independently. So is there any possibility to use the key distribution center in Manet? Uh, so that's a different aspect of security. I don't want to take that up here. Uh, I also don't know much about it. Uh, you should ask uh, Professor Bernard those questions. It's not a database security aspect. Sant Gajanan Maharaj, Buldana, please go ahead. Good morning, uh, Dr. Sudarshan, sir. Uh, I do have one question. Uh, the question is, uh, how the, uh, how what kind of mechanism is provided to the secure website? Say particularly HTTPS, mm. particularly when we are doing internet banking, mm. HTTPS occurs. So what kind of security mechanism uh, uh, the database people is provided uh, to the secured side? Okay, so HTTPS is uh, at the network level, and I'm sure it will be covered in this course. Uh, if it's not already been covered, it will be covered. So I'm not going to repeat that. That's not a database uh, level thing. Um, so, uh, to this session is focusing purely at the database level. So, HTTPS protects the data in transit. It also helps to identify the website. So, you know that you are talking to the authenticated website rather than talking to somebody else. So, it protects against certain things such as uh, somebody uh, routes your packets to a malicious site by hacking into the network and you think you are talking to Google but you are talking to somebody else. HTTPS is supposed to protect against this. Uh, there are uh, limitations, uh, there. it's not a 100% solution uh, because it's uh, based on a notion of digital certificates and if somebody is able to break into the certifying uh, authority and create fake certificates, then even which HTTPS you can get fooled. So there is no such thing as 100% uh, bulletproof thing, but uh, it's basically making the task of uh, hacking harder. Uh, so again, that will be covered elsewhere in this course, I'm not going to get into further details. I am going, going to, so we are going to assume that data in transit is protected and that you are not talking to a malicious server, you are talking to the actual database and security at the database and application program layer is what we are going to focus on. Thank you, sir. Okay, we will take one last question before we get back. Vaishnav Institute. What should be the security measures in neural network DBMS? In the network DBMS. Uh, security. Neural network. Hmm? Neural network. Neural network DBMS. Yeah. Uh, I think 
like uh, I don't understand what you're talking about. Uh, neural networks are used for uh, many tasks, classification and so on. What is the concept of security there? I don't know. Uh, it, I don't see the connection with database security uh, specifically. Uh, there are other connections with privacy and data mining, uh, which we will come to later in the talk. Uh, but at this point, uh, I don't have any answer to your particular question. Sri Shankaracharya, Chhattisgarh. How can we break into websites using authentication bypass? Uh, so that's uh, exactly the example I had with SQL injection. Um, if I'll go back to that slide and then uh, after that I'm going to uh, so I'm going to hang up on you and go back to the slide and explain that answer and after this we will get back to this. So let's say that uh, for authenticating uh, the user uh, the application programmer uh, had a query like this select a star from user where user ID equal to and this is a thing in let's say they typed it in Java single quote plus user ID which is taken from the uh, web application plus mm, and now a double quote co uh, single quote close for the user ID um, and password equals single quote then the Java string closes plus password plus and then a single quote to uh, terminate the SQL string. Okay? So this was the query that was constructed by concatenating user ID and password. So here uh, if the user types instead of a real user ID, uh, he types act, you, you, you want to get in as a particular user, let's say XYZ. So the person types XYZ quote um, dash dash. Then what happens is that this whole uh, query which is actually executed is just select star from user where user id equal to xyz after that everything is commented out so now the password is not checked at all and this is an example of authentication bypass using sql injection so it's just that particular term authentication bypass which i did not mention earlier but uh, this is how uh, this is one way in which you can bypass authentication there are probably many other ways but this is one particular way okay so with that let's get back to the slides. So where we were, uh, we were talking of passwords and scripts. Uh, so uh, coming back to SQL injection, uh, we had things like uh, somebody who uh, bypassed authorization. That was one kind. Another kind was uh, people who ran uh, delete uh, star from R or drop table R or uh, malicious things like that which go and modify some other table. So the problem is that the whole application is running under a common privilege and the database authorization is doing nothing to prevent SQL injection. So there was a question about can the database do something about SQL injection. So the answer is not directly, but if you extend the authorization mechanism in certain ways, which is not currently supported unfortunately, uh, you can partially safeguard against it's not a hundred percent thing so the key point here is that this particular user should have only had access to their records whatever they are authorized to see and not the authorization to drop a table but the problem is that the database has no idea who the application user is it only sees a single user the applications uh, database ID which has complete privileges um, so what you would like is an SQL feature where two things have to happen. First of all, the database should be aware of who is the end user accessing this uh, particular application, on whose behalf a query is being executed. And B, there should be an extended authorization mechanism that allows the database to restrict that particular application user to only certain rows of certain tables. So if you uh, have a grades table, it has grades of all students, but you want to restrict a particular student to see only their own grades, not other students' grades. So you need an extended authorization mechanism 
which can restrict people to see only some rows of a grid table, not other rows. This is something which SQL does not support today, although there are some extensions which I will talk about, which can provide this partially. Uh, and it turns out that uh, when the SQL uh, authorization mechanism was conceptualized uh, long back, 20, 30 years ago, the web was pretty much unknown. And the typical model was an uh, employee of an organization connected to a database, either directly or through a uh, reporting interface, and then ran queries on the database. So then the database knew who that employee was, and authorization made sense. But now that web applications are the dominant way of accessing a database, that is pretty much useless. And you need something different. So today, the fine-grained authorization, this is called fine-grained authorization, where you allow people to see only certain rows, but not others. That is implemented only at the application level, not at the database today. And because of this, if you can bypass the application authorization in some way, uh, you can do anything to the database. Um, so the applications uh, implement certain checks, uh, such as uh, which users are allowed to access which screens, and uh, then there are parameters in there. So for example, there's a screen which shows grades uh, to faculty members. It shows students' grades to faculty members. But it may look at the department of the faculty member and only show grades belonging to CSE, or only show grades of CSE students, not of other students. So these are forms of access control which cannot today be implemented in SQL, but they are typically implemented in the application layer. So you would like all these kinds of things to be done at some level in SQL itself. Um, so coming uh, to this, what is there today is application only in the uh, authorization only in the application layer. And since you're doing it in a language such as Java or PHP, you get a lot of control on what goes on. So it's easy to implement fine-grained authorization to specific tuples. And uh, the authorization can be based on business logic, such as this user is allowed to create a purchase order. That does not go into steps of, to create a purchase order, you get authorization to this table and to that table and something else. All that is encapsulated. You don't have to worry about it. So that makes life easier for authorization. But the drawback is the following, that authorization checks have to be done in the application code. And every single application interface has to implement authorization checks. Now, if you had the complete plan for authorization checks up front, you code it, and the plan never changes, maybe it's feasible. But in reality, over time, uh, authorization policies change. And sometimes, uh, when you tighten an authorization policy, you may forget to fix one of the interfaces, which was more relaxed. And sometimes there may be a forgotten authorization check, which uh, we saw earlier. So it's hard to check for this. And the amount of code written in the application layer is enormous. Checking this entire bunch of code for vulnerabilities is very hard. So the problem is this it's called the surface area of this code is very large. The amount of code that is there is very large. In contrast, if you could somehow do this in the database, then the only way to access the database is through SQL query. So if you have authorization at this level, uh, it's easy to enforce a policy, but it's difficult to enforce complex policies. Simple policies can be reliably enforced with no way to bypass it, so it's not vulnerable. But complex policies are harder to enforce. So what you need is a wire media between these. In particular, what you need is some form of fine-grained authorization in databases. And one of the early databases to provide this was Oracle, which implemented a feature called virtual private database. So what this does physically is the following. It provides a way to specify policies which add automatically extra authorization checks to queries. So take this particular query here. The user ran select star from grades. Let's say that this user is a student. Now, Oracle allows you to register a function with the table grades. So whenever a query uses the table grades, the function is called, and that function is going to return a string, which gets appended to the query. So now that particular function can check, what is the user? The current user is a student. In which case, 
we will do the following the function returns the string roll number equal to user id now the user id is taken from the application and uh, is provided by vpd uh, to the database system as a function so when the function sql function user id is executed it's going to return the id of the user on whose behalf this query is being executed note that this is an application user the database really has no idea about application users the database only knows one user which is the entire application runs as one user the application knows about application users and is it is actually passing this information to the database through this function user id so now the sql query can run this user defined function user id and get the id and check that roll number matches id so now the student can only see their own grades all other grades are filtered out they ran this query thinking they could see the grades of all users but lo and behold all they see are their own grades which is what they are authorized to see so that's the physical implementation and there are many applications for this one of the major applications is hosted applications where you have a single database which is shared amongst many organizations now if uh, some of you might have heard of companies like salesforce.com and others which allow you to run an entire uh, application on the web you just create an id for your organization create ids for individual users and you're off you can run it now many different organizations may be sharing a single database what vpd goal was was to ensure that organization a cannot by mistake get access to organization b's data even if a programmer goofs up in the application program so in vpd what you enforce is that you get the organization id and make sure that the uh, only the roles belonging to your organization are visible to you so that's the check that gets added here instead of role number is user id a more common use case is organization equal to your organization id and that ensures uh, protection of different organizations from each other on the shared database now that's oracle's vpd other databases have provided some similar support but it's been very limited for example db2 supports something called label based access control and oracle also has something called label based access control uh, which is uh, not quite as powerful as vpd but it does allow many things to be done um, and so that can and is used by many customers okay so that was uh, authorization at a fine grain level uh, now let's get back to uh, the next level up. Uh, so what about uh, insider <coughs> attack so far we have been talking of outsider attack the outsider is trying to hack into the application or into the database and how do we protect that um, but most databases actually are a lot more vulnerable to insiders uh, for example at iit bombay uh, there are all, all our grades salaries so many other things are on databases and there are many people who have access to these databases and as a result there are many people who could potentially go in and modify the data so we are trusting a lot of people to not do anything bad and in fact you know people have lived up to the trust uh, by many i mean something like 3 4 i'm not talking of hundreds when you have hundreds you have no idea what is going on when you have 3 4 people know that if something goes wrong it will be traced back to them Uh, and of course you also make sure you pick honest people and uh, don't allow access to others uh so among the things which any application uh, system should do is to keep this the database password of the master database restricted to a few people and don't give it to the development team so there's another so we have many programmers we have four or five people with the master password we have many people who develop applications but do not have the password to the main database they have passwords to a test database they can run their application on the test database but they cannot access the actual database and that password is stored on a configuration file on the live server which the others don't have access to so that's how iit safeguards the database password um but of course uh, when you have something like uh, rto office which inherently has a lot of corruption uh, even these few trusted people can become untrusted so you need to do something about it which could involve uh, maybe keeping audit trails of what happened who accessed the data and uh, i'll briefly mention this later 
but some researchers have been asking why should we do it this way why should we um, have the application connect to the database using a password can't the OS uh, authenticate the application to the database so this is called um, trusted application so the OS looks at the code of the application and knows that this code belongs to this particular application which is trusted and the OS authenticates the application to the database um, so this is uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's there in products yet but there's a lot of research on this um, and it is used for certain applications I don't know if it's currently available for databases I don't think it is partly because uh, the databases today tend to be decoupled from the application servers. So now uh, we have know that insiders can access the database. Can we do something to prevent them from doing too much damage if they can access the data? Uh, one obvious thing is to have digital signatures. So the person sitting in the data center who uh, has access to the database does not have access to your uh, signature key. So the uh, person who is updating the data, maybe a registrar or a professor or whatever, is able to sign the data and then the signed data is stored in the database. Um, so this is good for certain things uh, which are updated rarely. You can have a smart card to store the key so uh, nobody else can store it except the person who ha physically has access to the smart card and uh, so the database administrator can't do anything to that data to some extent they can't put new data fake data but they can very much delete data so if you have registered your property somebody goes in there deletes your registration and then somebody comes in and registers your property again you have a problem so this has some benefits but it's not a hundred percent solution there are lower tech solutions in use today for example if you register property in India pretty much anywhere you need a photograph to be taken at the registration center so that they know that the person who owns the property is actually selling the property. Um, the last bullet here talks of restricting access to the database. It turns out that uh, many places uh, had every RTO have a local database. That means you are trusting many, many people. So uh, these days uh, they have moved these to a central uh, system. So there are hundreds of RTO offices, but only one central database with all the data. Uh, and therefore, the number of people who have uh, insider access is limited now. Instead of a few per RTO office or registration office, you have a few across the whole state or across the nation. So then it's a lot more secure. And then there are many more uh, application level protections against insider attacks. For example, multi-person approval is standard practice in banks and accounts. One person creates it, another person approves it. If one person's uh, user ID is compromised, you can still guard against the other person. If one person is corrupt, you can still guard against uh, illegal states unless the second person also becomes corrupt. Uh, and then there's the issue of who gets authorization to do what. Now there's actually a trade-off here. One way is to be very careful and restrict authorization to only a few people. But practically, what happens is people go and leave. And if one of the people with authorization is not around, then others cannot do work which is needed for the organization to function. And uh, so in practice, authorizations are granted fairly loosely uh, that by uh, destroying uh, the uh, protection of the database. So those are human problems. So now if uh, something bad has happened, you want to find out what has happened. Now, how do you do this? And you do this typically by using an audit trail. I don't know if this has been covered in your course. It probably will be. But uh, let me very briefly tell you what happens in audit trails. Uh, first of all, there's an application level audit trail. The application typically logs everything that was done. Um, so if a particular user is uh, doing something which looks weird, you may not detect it immediately, but you may have an applica a separate application running in the background looking at the log records and looking for patterns of fraudulent access. Supposing, for example, uh, you have credit card authorizations on a particular credit card happening in India today at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. and happening in Russia at 6 p.m. Now, if that was a Russian website, maybe that's okay. 
but if it was a Russian shop, then it's impossible for a credit card to fly from here to Russia in a few hours. Okay, so you know it must be fraudulent. If it happened one day later, maybe it's fraudulent, maybe it's not. So depending on the history of the user's travel or whatever, the system may either block it or allow this. Uh, so you can use the audit trail to find patterns and alert people. And if something bad has happened, you can look at the audit trail and see who accessed this data from where and thereby try to identify the actual human behind this. Then there's a database level audit trail, which is even lower than the application level. Uh, it turns out that the way applications are written today with a single database user, uh, the database audit trail is not terribly useful to know who did it, but it might be useful to know what had happened. If you find an update has happened at this time, maybe you can correlate it with who was logged in from where and then track, narrow down the user who did that particular update. So even though the database doesn't know who is the user, uh, you can correlate it with other log information and track it down. Okay, I think this is a good point to take some more questions before I come back to two research uh, level topics, uh, which will be the last two topics for this talk. So let's take some questions. BH Gardi College, Rajkot, please go ahead. Uh, sir, my question is uh, any particular uh, tool for uh, finding SQL injection for in a particular website which we develop for each and every list out the particular where the brute force are there? Yes, there are a uh, lot of tools uh, which are available uh, on the web. You can search for them. Uh, so most of them will look for uh, form interfaces and then uh, type in strings like what I told you, quote star 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 and look for error messages of various forms to be returned. So uh, I don't have a specific tool to recommend, but if you search on the web, you will find tools for vulnerability analysis. Um, so if you have built an application, I would highly recommend you run these tools. Dronacharya, uh, Farooq Nagar, Haryana, please go ahead. Sir, my question is, uh, can database encryption and database user ID and password encryptions mm -hmm. can solve the problem of database security? Over to you, sir. So there are many aspects to database security, right? So encryption handles certain things. So let's say you have a house with three doors. Locking one door is required to protect that door, but it's not going to protect you from somebody coming in through other doors. So encryption is going to protect against somebody who is, gets physical access to the data, maybe by uh, copying the disk or something. And uh, uh, it is not going to protect against certain other things, such as uh, somebody uh, using SQL injection to hack into the application. So encryption is not going to protect against that. So it is required for many things, but it's not the end all. So there's no one thing which will cover everything. You have to take multiple steps to protect against multiple types of attacks. You have to uh, check for and rewrite applications to remove SQL injection. Uh, you have to make sure uh, database passwords are stored securely. You have to guard against um, uh, uh, cross-site scripting attacks. I, I didn't talk about it because I assume it will be covered elsewhere in your course. But when you build an application, this is a very important thing. You have to uh, protect against cross-site scripting attacks by uh, essentially what is called sanitizing of uh, user input. If you have not already seen this, uh, you remove uh, certain uh, HTML commands from user input. So when that is displayed, uh, the ability to run cross-site script attacks is removed. Uh, then there are also uh, things which can be done at the browser level to protect different uh, for example, you have multiple tabs open in the browser. Uh, so a script running on one tab might be able to access uh, data, uh, uh, access sites which are opened by a separate tab. So uh, there are browsers like Chrome which actually run these in separate processes and protect against some of these attacks. So there are many different things which need to be done and only if you do all of them can you actually ensure security. Even if you do all of them, there may still be holes you don't know about. For example, uh, very recently there was a hole in the SSH uh, algorithm, which was a bug which was found, which meant that intruders could actually eavesdrop on uh, sec supposedly secure communication between uh, browsers and uh, web servers. Uh, so that 
was discovered and then the web servers had to be patched to uh, protect against that bug. So if a web server is not patched, for example, it still remains vulnerable to that bug and uh, then you have a problem. So patching these uh, things to fix security flaws which have been discovered and fixed is another important part of security. So there are many, many aspects, uh, even to just data security. Any other questions? No, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Permail uh, College. What is stored procedure? What is the difference between stored procedure and other statements? And last question is, where we can use the stored procedure effectively? Okay. A stored procedure is like a function which you can record in the database, and then you can call the function with certain parameters. So those parameters have to be of type string or int or whatever it is. So now, um, if you want to call a stored procedure from a Java program, uh, there is a JDBC call, uh, 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 API call to call a procedure, uh, passing it certain parameters. So that is similar in some sense to a prepared statement in the sense that if that string has quotes in it, it is going to add backslashes and so on, uh, so that what goes to the database is a properly escaped string, um, and then the database is protected from SQL injection. Uh, so that's basically an alternative to prepared statements. Uh, but as I told you, it is not a good alternative because you have to create a procedure for every single query that you might want to do. Uh, but there are certain cases where it is useful and could be used. Uh, so the main use for stored procedures is when you want to do certain updates within the database without doing them from JDBC. So if you have a series of statements that have to be executed, a series of database queries, instead of a back and forth with the application server and the web server, it's all done inside of the database server, and that can speed up performance. So that's one use. A second use is uh, if you have certain things which you might want to keep one copy in the database one of a procedure, which you might need to update, uh, and you don't want to update the application program, but you want to update the stored procedure periodically, that might be another reason for using a stored procedure. So there are multiple reasons for it, and most databases today support stored procedures. Uh, does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Then one more question. Uh, as uh, we know that a uh, lot of security tools is available for cyber security. Mm. Likewise, uh, is there any tool for database security? And uh, SQL itself can we provide securities uh, without using Oracle or the thing, the front end itself? Um, so in terms of database security, um, yeah, I'm not, there are tools which are specific to, for example, tools which will look for SQL injection by probing uh, systems. But you can also have static uh, analysis tools which can look at your code and say that this part of your code is vulnerable to SQL injection. So there are uh, such tools which can analyze your code and look for vulnerabilities which are specific to databases. Um, so that's what you would use. Now. Coming back to the second part of your question, I'm not sure what you meant by at the SQL level. Um, as I told you, the uh, authorization mechanisms, if extended, today what is there is not sufficient to provide any meaningful degree of uh, protection. But there are uh, extensions which have been proposed in research papers, uh, and some of which have been implemented by some databases like Oracle, but they're not part of the SQL standard yet, uh, which you could use to give some extra level of protection. Thank you, sir. Techno India, Bengal, please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. My question is, instead of centralized database, if hmm. we keep, the, keep our data in distributed environment, that is distributed database, hmm. uh, what is the security issues there? And if data is, we keep data, there is, we allow replication, hmm. then what are the security issues in that case? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so first of all, uh, there are two types of security issues here. Uh, the first is when you have multiple uh, systems which store the data, you obviously have to protect all the systems. But today, the, by far the largest use of this kind of distributed data stores, they're actually ubiquitous today. If you uh, put data on any website, nobody uses a centralized uh, database to store your data. Every major website today stores your data on uh, either on file systems for certain kinds of data, distributed file systems, or they store it on distributed uh, data storage systems. 
Um, so for example, Google uses something called Bigtable. Uh, other uh, application servers use things like uh, you know, HBase, uh, Cassandra, and a variety of other systems which store data in a distributed fashion across multiple systems. Now many of these systems really don't have any notion of authorization mechanism beyond some very simple authorization. They have a notion of a login and who can, which logins can access which uh, tables in the store. Uh, so the entire onus of security is purely at the application program level. So there's no uh, further security at the data storage engine level. Uh, now with replication, what are the extra issues? So again, you have to obviously keep all copies secure. But there is a new aspect which has come up these days, which is uh, protection against governments. So today, if you store data on Google, and Google stores that data on a server in the US, Google may take a lot of steps to protect you from hackers getting in. But Google cannot do anything if the government of the US asks for that data. Google has to give that data. Otherwise, they'll go to jail, as per US laws. So, uh, in spite of all the protection which you thought you were getting from Google, the US government can get your information by just telling Google to hand it over. In addition to asking Google to hand it over, which of course has some overhead because they have to tell Google, Google has to check it and give it back, they also have hacked into Google's systems uh, or actually hacked into the network to spy on traffic going to Google. Um, so that's another kind of thing. So if your data is stored in the US, uh, it's very likely the US government can and will get access to the data if it thinks that you are of interest to them. Uh, so that kind of vulnerability can only be avoided if the data never goes to the US. So many uh, companies these days are seriously looking at uh, storing data of India in India, storing data of US users in the US so that uh, if they are asked by the US government to hand over data, they can legally say that, look, this data is owned by a subsidiary in India, and we cannot access that. You have to ask that subsidiary. Conversely, if the government of India asks data about an Indian, the sub Indian subsidiary is forced to hand over the data. It's available locally. It doesn't have to go back to the US uh, thing to, say, uh, uh, to tell them hand over the data, because they will sometimes get into trouble. The US may say you cannot hand over the data. The Indian government may say you must hand over the data. And now, Google is caught in the middle. In fact, there is a mess going on in Europe right now where the European Union was bringing up some law on um, making search engines forget about history. That law is not actually complete, but meanwhile a court ruled that users can ask Google to delete certain data, uh, certain search information about themselves. So now a user can tell Google this newspaper published a report which was unfavorable to me, delete it. It should no longer show up in your search results. And now this is a total mess for Google, because how do they know whether this user is doing it in a genuine way, which, or in a way to hide uh, unsavory incidents from uh, others, which really should not have been hidden. So it's a big mess, and uh, they are trying to resolve the jurisdiction issue. But even with that, there is still a mess when you have idiotic laws like this. OP Jindal, you'll get the last question on this topic before I wrap up the session. Sir, is there any option of data hiding in database management system? Uh, by hiding, uh, what no. do you mean? If you mean encryption, yes, that is one way to hide data from uh, physically uh, unauthorized users. Uh, other than that, the authorization mechanisms are the key way of hiding data from users who are not authorized to see the data. So yes, uh, that's exactly what is uh, the role of authorization mechanisms. I hope that answers your question. I think in the interest of time, I will stop taking further questions and wrap up the last few slides in my talk. So now let's come back to a couple of uh, research topics. I finished with detecting security. So the last few slides are on <coughs> security in outsourced cloud databases and privacy. So today, a uh, lot of organizations are looking at outsourcing their databases. What do I mean by that? Setting up an ERP system setting up storage systems, backing up the data, and uh, you know, buying equipment to ensure high availability and so on is very expensive. An organization the size of IIT, which has uh, maybe 2,000 plus employees, itself finds that dedicating uh, 40, 50 employees to this area becomes very expensive. 
and smaller organizations really can't do this. So they would like to have uh, somebody provide the entire application and the database and everything is out there in the cloud. So that's called outsource applications. Now there are certain people who are fine with completely outsource applications, but there are others who say that look, maybe I will outsource my database itself, but my application program will run locally and I will have control on it. And the goal here is that you can encrypt the data stored externally uh, and decrypt it within the organization. Uh, so there's been a bunch of research on this model, which says that, look, supposing I encrypt the data in the database, the database does not have the encryption key. The application has it. Can the application fetch from the database just the records of a particular employee ID, one, two, three, four, five, six? Now the data is encrypted in the database. The database cannot see this employee ID. Is it possible to fetch just the records for this employee without even telling the database what this ID is? Okay, so can you do this? It turns out that there are certain limited places where you can do this. For example, if you encrypt the employee ID, when you run a selection query, you will do the same encryption on the ID provided in the application program and send that encrypted ID to the database. So the database is comparing one encrypted ID to another encrypted ID and it can fetch just that record. So that is one way. Another way is to not encrypt IDs but encrypt only sensitive data. So these are in fact used. Um, but now supposing I want to do more complex computation. I want to encrypt salaries but I want to find the average salary in the database without transferring all the encrypted salary data back to the application server. It turns out this is not easy, but there's been a bunch of research on certain limited cases where you can do computation of certain forms, addition and so on, on encrypted data and fetch that resultant sum back and decrypt it to get the sum. So this is a, a fairly tricky area, but there has been a lot of research in recent years on this. I'm not sure it's practical. I'm not sure it'll even ever become practical, but people are trying to make it practical. Now, even if you encrypt data and store it in a remote database, there are still many kinds of attacks possible. For example, a person who hacks into that database may replace my salary with some other encrypted value. And if you decrypt it, you get a legal value, which is not my salary. So the application is not able to detect that there is a problem. Um, or it might just delete some records. And the application does not realize that some records are missing. So it deletes me totally. Application has no idea that my employee records have been deleted. So even though the data is encrypted, that does not protect against certain things. So how do you deal with this? There has been some very interesting research on data structures for, called Merkle trees, which can detect such modification uh, in a fairly efficient manner. I don't have the time to get into what these details are, but I just want to highlight to you that this is an interesting research area. So a lot of research may be five, six years ago, it was a very hot topic. Even today, there is some ongoing research in this topic. Uh, there are not too many practical solutions yet, but people are working towards it. So at least some limited forms of protection can be provided for outsourced data. Now the last topic I'm going to cover is privacy. So what is this about? So there's a lot of uh, data which you don't want to uh, be let out to everybody. But at the same time, you want limited information from that to be made available for the public good. For example, you have records of diseases which people have got. You really don't want to announce to the world that this person has a typhoid or this person has HIV and so on. There are laws about this. On the other hand, if I see a cluster of typhoid cases in a particular area, then I realize something is going on. There's an epidemic and it's time to have an intervention. Maybe the intervention could be to tell people, hey, there's a typhoid epidemic in your area, boil your water and don't drink untreated water. And that might end that epidemic. So I need some information without revealing individual users' information. Uh, so uh, this was done uh, in the US in the following way. They said you can release anonymized information um, of medical data. You remove the names. But you want to know where epidemics are happening. So you need a rough geographical area. For this, the PIN code was allowed. 
And then you want to know whether it's a man or a woman because certain diseases affect men and women differentially. So you need that. You also need to know the age of the individual because some things affect children, some things affect adults. So they allowed these three to be retained and released. Unfortunately, it turned out that with just this three pieces of information, zip code, or pin code, the gender, and the date of birth, in a very large number of cases, you can uniquely identify a person. There are not that many people with the same date of birth and gender in the same pin code. Actually, pin codes in India cover a fairly large area. Zip codes in the US are more narrow. Uh, so it turns out, turned out that the publicly available medical records in Massachusetts could be used to find out the medical history of the governor of Massachusetts. Some researcher did this and announced this, uh, which was a big embarrassment. So subsequently, there were laws which specifically say you cannot release these three pieces of information. You have to hide something in there. Um, so there are now laws about privacy. So there is a trade-off there. There's another interesting case where America, on, so, so there are a lot of people working on web search. And web search quality depends a lot on search history of users. So Google has access to that data. Microsoft has access to your search history. But if you are a new company or if you are an academic sitting in IIT Bombay, you don't have access to that. Now there were some nice people at America Online, a company which now is not doing well. Uh, but some years ago, uh, they were doing better. And they said that, look, people do search on us. We will release anonymized information about searches to help academic researchers. So they were nice people who put out the data. But it turned out that most people do uh, what is called ego surfing. So they search for their name on the database, uh, on, on the, over there. And then they search for their locality. You know, I search for Powai. I search for my name. So now I know that this particular uh, set of queries came from Sudarshan in Powai. How many Sudarshans are there in Powai? Probably not too many. And therefore, people can find out exactly what I've searched for. If I have gone to uh, some shady website, now they know that I have gone there. So that was very embarrassing. And in fact, some people in the company, including some Indian employees, were fired after this incident. So that's a big problem. So the question is, how to balance usefulness of data which you reveal with while protecting privacy? And there have been a lot of interesting research in this area. Um, it's a very active area still. Uh, there's also been a lot of uh, government intervention in this area with laws on privacy protection. So the Indian IT Act amendment in 2008 says things about this. The, uh, in the US, the HIPAA and Sarbanes-Oxley Acts have legislated various things. In India, there's a conflict uh, to some extent between Right to Information Act and privacy, uh, which is, keeps getting resolved by subsequent rulings. So it's a very interesting area, which uh, many people will have to deal with going forward. So with that, I'll end my talk. Shastra Tanjavur, please go ahead. What are the problems that arise while migrating data from one cloud center to another? Um, so I don't know if there are any security issues here. There are a lot of um, other issues, performance and so on. Uh, usually cloud databases are extremely large volume, so migrating such large volumes of data would overload networks and there are many other issues, but I don't think they are security related, uh, so I won't uh, uh, get into those other details. Sri Buddha, Alappi. Sir, sir, myself Adas from Sri Buddha College of Engineering. Sir, so my question is about slice databases, you have told about this anonymous database. So can we create the slice databases and uh, escape from this problem of SQL injection? Okay. So uh, I think the question is if you can create a database slice for a particular user and allow them to only access data within that slice, can you safeguard against SQL injection? Uh, SQL yeah. Uh, it's, uh, certainly it would help a lot because if you only allow the user to access information in their own data uh, which they are allowed to anyway read or things which they are anyway allowed to modify, then uh, by doing SQL injection, they can't touch any other data. Uh, so that's uh, related to the um, uh, fine-grained authorization which I talked about. So if you are able to do that, you can get some pr uh, good amount of protection from SQL injection. Uh, but if you code your application properly, then uh, you get 100% uh, protection from 
SQL injection. So it's a good idea to do both. Uh, the uh, checking the application, coding it carefully, and checking it for vulnerability by static analysis is probably the easier solution, which is what organizations are doing. But the other one could form a longer term uh, a solution for us, uh, other classes of things. Yeah. Does that answer your question, or do you have Slicing a follow-up? techniques. Sir, sir, can you suggest some good slicing techniques? Which slicing? Uh, no, I don't have any specific uh, suggestion on that. Vivekananda College, Namakkal. Good afternoon, sir. My, my question is, in a security process, I mean the data information security process, how long we can expect the data information will be safe? Whether it is a follow-up of members, uh, authentic authentication members, it's needed for the data information will be safe? Okay, I'm not quite sure I understand it. I think the first part of your question is, how long should you keep data? Is that what you were asking? Yeah. So, there are various laws on this and um, so most companies are required to keep certain information for a minimum period of time. For example, accounting information you may have to maintain by Indian law for I don't know how many years, maybe 15 years because till then the tax authorities can come back and question you about what, ha what you did back then. Um, so now for uh, web uh, services which keep individual user information, there are certain cases where they will keep history of what you did for a certain amount of time. Now again, there are some legal requirements. For example, the governments may say that you want to keep a history of accesses for three months or six months or so on, and they will keep it for that much time. Now many companies don't want to keep it longer for two reasons. One is that uh, they may overload their storage or cost performance issues by keeping too much data. Or by keeping a lot of data, they may just uh, you know, invite more government uh, queries on old data and cause more trouble for themselves in terms of employee time devoted to answering these questions. So many organizations have policies that we will keep data for the uh, time that is mandated by the government and then throw it out later. By keeping data, I don't mean your files. Your files, they keep forever. But log information and other such things, uh, which they, uh, you know, they will keep for some amount of time and then they will throw it off. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Screen level, what is the main focus of screen level authorization, sir? Yeah, so pretty much any application which you use, uh, let's say an enterprise system, there are many, many screens to do various things, maybe to create purchase orders, to approve bills, to um, you know uh, update salary and so on. So any ERP system, has uh, literally hundreds or thousands of screens, maybe far more in fact. And different people are authorized to do different things, are authorized to see or use different screens. So this is what I mean by screen level authorization. So if there's a screen to update salary, you, you may not get it as a teacher, but a salary clerk may get it to allow them to update your salary. Uh, so that's what screen level authorization is about. I think I should wrap up. Uh, thank you very much.